Today I'm going to tell you five things you can do with an amateur radio license that have nothing to do with talking on a radio. Coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to another video. I am Ria N2RJ and welcome to Ria Shack. On this channel we talk about ham radio and we talk about other radio related hobbies that may or may not have to do with amateur radio. If you're new to the channel, why don't you check us out and give us a like and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Um, doing so helps us get this in front of more people and that definitely helps us. All right, okay, let's get into it. Today we're gonna talk about five things you can do with an amateur radio license that isn't necessarily talking on the radio. So, a lot of people tell me that how, hey, you know, I'm getting into ham radio, but I'm, I'm not interested in talking on the radio. And you know what? That's fine, because initially when I got licensed, I wasn't really interested in talking on the radio either. I was interested in a lot of other things radio related. In my early days in ham radio and radio hobbies in general, I was a shortwave listener. And um, I also got involved in scanning of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, scanning is not really allowed by local authorities, but most people did it anyway. And it's been so long, it's past the statute of limitations anyway. So we used to listen to a lot of different things. Anyway, these are some of the things you can do in amateur radio, but we're gonna talk about five specific things. So number one, you have a cell phone. You probably have a cell phone. You're probably watching this on a cell phone. You probably send a text message on your cell phone sometime, one time or the other. Well, do you know that you can use amateur radio to send a text message? You can send it to another amateur or you can send it actually to cell phones. So there is a system called APRS, the Automatic Position Reporting System. And people tend to think that, well, it's just about tracking vehicles and tracking people. So how APRS works is that it uses GPS and it uses packet radio, which is a mode for data transmission, primarily on VHF and UHF, but there's also an HF. And packet radio and GPS came together to form APRS. Now, APRS was developed by none other than Bob Bruninger, WB4APR, and Bob and I have talked about a number of different topics. He's big into alternative energy and electric vehicles and that kind of stuff. Bob's a really cool guy if you get to know him. But he developed a system called APRS. Now, some people call it APRS, by the way. APRS, what do you need for APRS? Well, like I mentioned, it's GPS and packet radio. So you used to have to get a separate radio and a separate GPS receiver and a separate TNC and you had to hook that in with a computer and then it used to get really complicated. Well, you'll find that some of the radio manufacturers like Kenwood and Yesu in particular, they came out with radios that support APRS out of the box. I have a Kenwood THD74 and this has all of the bits necessary for APRS. And what I can do on this radio is I can go into the APRS menu and then select a destination, send, and I can send that either to somebody's call sign or I can send it to something called SMS gate, right? And it's spelled S-M-S-G-T-E. And with that, I can send the phone number and we'll send a text message, and of course a message, I could send that text message to a regular cell phone, which I have here. And that's pretty neat. I was quite surprised the first time that I was able to do it, but apparently you can do it. And um, I, you know, it came to its logical conclusion. So that's pretty neat and I like it a lot. The only thing is that you must be near a packet node or an APRS node that has the ability to connect to the internet or connect to another APRS node that has that internet capability. And then it will route your message through. 
because that's pretty much how APRS works. I'm going to do a, a long form video on APRS one day. So, you know, stay tuned for that. But um, yeah, it works pretty well. I like it. And, um, you know, between SMS gate and sending messages to other people, you will see um, the ability to messaging is very handy. I've actually demonstrated this to several people, including Girl Scouts, and they were able to, you know, see, wow, you can do this with amateur radio. Yeah, you can. One other thing you can do, you there are bots on APRS that will relay data if you send a text message to them. So, you know, like on the cell phone, you can send a text message to a number and then get back information. Well, there are a few of them. The one I, I know, um, the one that I know um, I'm most familiar with is WA1GOV. If you send him certain messages, you will be able to get back certain data. Like for example, you could send him a message and get a, a weather forecast for your area. You can, um, and basically it will come back to you and it'll also play on, um, it'll also post to his Twitter account. So it's pretty neat. So yeah, so that is text messaging on amateur radio. Well, the second one is taking the, taking it to its logical conclusion. You can send email on amateur radio. So you can use the most popular of these systems is called Winlink. And Winlink is actually popular with sailboat enthusiasts and RVers because you can then use a radio and a modem or even just a sound card in your computer and the radio, and then you can send email through to through the internet, basically using amateur radio. Now, how this works is that you have to go on to winlink.org, you have to sign up, and you have to get the SCS modem if you're using Pactor, or you could use different software called Vara, V-A-R-A, I used to use one called Win More, um, Win M O R More, but that one has fell out of favor because it's just an outdated protocol. So they're using one called Vara. A lot of like the, the maritime users use the SCS modems, and they are basically being used for messaging, email. They get position reports, they get weather, and all sorts of stuff. It's also used extensively in emergency communications. It's not without controversy. There are a number of people who think that the messages are encrypted and such, but in reality, they're not. They're, they're, um, they can be decoded over the air, and this has been demonstrated. One other thing that they've done as well is they've put the, message, the messages online on their website so anybody can register with them and then go and view the messages for Winlink. And um, it's really, you know... It's, it, it's really a transparent system, I would say. I'm not endorsing them one way or the other, but it's something you can do. So yeah, so you have email through amateur radio, and that's another cool thing you could do. One other thing I would say is that there, there are other systems that have tried to send email. For example, you would have email through something called PSK Mail, and PSK Mail used uh, a system called um, use a mode called PSK31 or PSK63 and it sent these messages over there. It worked for a while, but I think it just got, eventually just got taken over by Winlink, meaning that um, Winlink was just so popular that, you know, it just got um, superseded. All right, so that is email over amateur radio. Number three, you can send pictures over amateur radio. So there are several ways you can send pictures. One of the more popular ones is using something called slow scan TV. And with slow scan TV, what you're using is you're using, well, today you're using a software package and most people use something called MMSS TV. And you send, you basically load up a JPEG picture in it and it will then send it over radio. Now, don't be confused. This is not some sort of digital transmission of the picture. It is actual analog transmission. So what happens is the image is sent line by line in an analog format over the air. This is why you hear these tones and they sound basically like, you know, a bunch of whistles. And um, 
You'll find that a lot of pictures are received with noise. Well, that's because they're analog and they're still subject to the variations on the HF bands, which is where you'll hear most slow scan TV. One cool thing you might not have known, or you may have known, I mean, regular people on my channel would probably know this anyway, but um, the International Space Station often broadcasts messages on slow scan TV, and they will have days where they send out, you know, basically a couple days where they're, they're sending out slow scan TV constantly on their VHF downlink frequency, I think is 145.8. And um, you just have to hook up a radio to your computer and decode the messages that way. In some cases, you don't even need a directional antenna. If, you, if the pass of the ISS is good, and there are websites where you could see the passes or their smartphone apps, you can see those SSTV messages just with a um, regular WIP antenna. Yeah, so, you know, you take your handheld radio and the WIP antenna, that's it. You don't need anything else. Other uses for slow scan TV, I mean, it's useful for emergency messaging where people are sending pictures of a scene, you know, like disaster areas and such. But most people just use it for fun, for swapping pictures. One interesting thing is I saw some pirate radio stations actually send their uh, quote unquote QSL cards through SSTV while they were broadcasting, which I found quite amusing. I, I, I wouldn't publish some of them here because some of them are kind of, um, you know, not appropriate for children. And I like to keep my channel family friendly. Okay, so that is slow scan TV, but there are actually other methods of sending pictures over amateur radio. So ICOM has the D-Star mode because it's primarily ICOM, even though Kenwood offers D-Star. They have the ability through some of their radios to connect to an Android phone and an Android app, and then they can send pictures from the phone through the handheld radio. Yesu has similar capability with a system fusion on the fusion radios. Of course, e these two systems are not compatible. Some people have likened it to VHS versus beta. Uh, you know, in amateur radio, there are no standards because you're not, um, you're, you're in this, this hobby and service to experiment. You're not in it to, you know, to have utility communications. So a lot of people de develop a lot of different things. But um, these handheld radios out of the box, you connect your Android phone and you connect your Android app and you're able to send pictures over radio. Pretty cool. So that is one way to do it. Now on the SSTV side, actually on HF, there have been different digital modes for sending pictures digitally. There's a program called EasyPal. Now EasyPal is uh, touted as a slow scan TV program but EasyPal actually, um, it will send the picture as data. So you take a picture, load it up in JPEG, and then send it over the air. And then the other party will receive it and decode it. That's one way. The other way is that EasyPal will send the other side a link to a photo to download on the internet. This might be fun, but I really don't consider it the same. I think if it's not, if you're not actually sending the, the actual photo over the internet, well, it's not really slow scan TV. But you know what? People have fun with it. So who am I to criticize? So that's picture messaging on amateur radio. Number four, let's talk about FT8. So, and other weak signal digital modes. And let's throw in whisper for good measure. So. A lot of people get into radio, not for the purpose of talking on the radio, obviously, but um, you want to investigate propagation. You want to know how far your radio signal travels because you're just nerdy like that. And one way you do that is you can either get on the radio and talk to other people. You know, you can use Morse code, which is another way, but a lot of people use digital modes such as FT8. And I mentioned in several seminars and presentations that I gave about this that you can actually determine 
the propagation at your location by just decoding FT8 all day long and then looking at a map on a site called pskreporter.info and you can actually see what's decoded when. And that'll give you a fairly good idea of what your station can do. You take this one step further, you use Whisper, WSPR, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter, and you're able to now do it two ways. You can transmit and receive, and you can see where the band opens and closes at your location. I actually got this tip from K3LR. He gave this at a presentation at Hamcom Conference in Texas, which I used to attend every year, but of course they're now kaput. Too bad, so sad. That was a nice conference, but yeah, you you have there is a special software package you use actually and then you could get like detailed analysis of propagation conditions and he says he runs it a week before every contest which explains a lot. So you'll determine, you know, how your antennas are doing, where where you might find special openings in the bands at certain times of the day or night. It's pretty neat. All right, so let's go for the final one. Okay, you know this one was coming because I'm a model aircraft enthusiast. I'm also a drone pilot. In case you missed that one, I'll put a link to it and you can go watch that video. Well, with amateur radio, you can control model craft. And I mean both model aircraft and other forms of model craft. So you can control you can control anything remote controlled, like for example, you can control a model airplane, you can control a drone, you can control a model boat, you can control a model remote control model um, car or something. Beyond the distance that normally you would be able to with the stock part 15 transmitter. There is a provision in the FCC rules that allows you to operate model craft and they have some very specific stipulations. Number one, the most important, you cannot exceed one watt of transmitter power. The other rule is that, and this is a good one, you do not need to identify your signal so that's fine. So if you buy something stock from a manufacturer, you don't have to actually go and modify it to transmit your call sign. What you do have to do is the transmitter must be labeled with your call sign. So that is a very easy way to actually get more range out of your model craft. And I noticed that quite a few people actually do that. They would buy one of these FPV drones or home built drones that you know, and they want to get more range out of it and they get a ham license and they are able to transmit um, one watt. And uh, it's pretty neat. So anyway, that's something you can do. Hey, I saved the best for last. All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. I am N2RJ. If you found this content useful, I would appreciate if you liked and subscribed. And I'll see you in the next one. 73 N2RJ. Keep on hamming. See ya.